This is the Cook Islands, a small self-governing New Zealand territory nestled in the heart of Polynesia. On this picture-perfect playground stands a monument that has birthed its own myths and been mused to its own mysteries of murder, makutu and mafia ties. So, in a country whose economy relies heavily on tourism, why does this almost completed luxury hotel lie dilapidated, decrepit and decaying? When Rarotong was first settled by the Polynesians between 900 and 1200 AD, the island was divided up by the three ariki, or chiefs, lines drawn from the maunga at the centre of the island. And a traditional system of land allocation between each tribe operated then as it still does now. Basically, it's the feudal system. Chief, Mataiopos, Dangtiris, that's all. That's how the land is allocated. And in a time prior to European settlement, that land in Vaimanga, where what was to be the future Sheraton now stands, was perhaps the most coveted. And the ancestors of the current Pa Ariki fought over it fiercely. The history about that land is it belonged to Pa. He went to war with the first Ariki Tinamana in Uruti. And they went to war and he won. That land, he gifted all of it to the Mataia boats, except that one, he kept that one for himself. Land ownership is one of the worst things in the Polynesian culture. We will be friends today and we'll fight each other tomorrow over land. Who actually owned the land would always remain a point of dispute for rival clans, particularly the Mores. But in 1902, the then Pa Ariki officially claimed ownership as the Cook Islands set about establishing official land laws. At the time, you can lease a piece of land in Rarotong for 99 years, but you can never sell it. You cannot partition and disown your own people from owning land. So that meant anyone with the means could lease land in the Cook Islands. And with a high export demand for cotton and copra, New Zealand settler William Wigmore jumped at the chance to lease this property to develop farms. And unbeknownst to the Mores, who still claimed ownership over this land, a 99-year lease was granted to Wigmore by Pa Ariki. And in 1911, the land dispute came to a violent head. While the land was in with Moore's uh, possession, Rung Maori came back uh, with his uh, son, Mori Uritau. He went to see Wigmore and said, uh, give my land back, and then he was shot. William Wigmore gunned down Mori Uriatua. All he did was ask for his land back. Metua a Uriatua, distraught over her father's death, placed a curse to condemn any business on the land to fail, unless it was returned to the Mores, in her eyes, the rightful owners. Yeah, uh, there's some talk about the, the fact that the land is jinxed and all of that. That's nonsense. Um, you know, I mean, everybody can make their own stories, but the reality is there was an altercation and, um, and uh, this man was shot. And uh, I think the old man Wigmore was convicted and uh, served the sentence. So the lease remained with the Wigmores, the curse becoming something more of a myth than a matter of fact. Welcome to the island of the hey, soft, I I but as tourism became the focus of the Cook Islands economy, the curse would get a new lease of life at the end of the 1980s. It was a, at a time which, as I understand, that the Italian government uh, created an export credit scheme for its artisans and building companies, construction companies, 
to go out into the world and uh, sell their expertise and materials um, with uh, government backed uh, finance. So they came around the South Pacific offering these turnkey hotel deals. Some people from Italy arrived on Rarotonga, came to the government and said, we have $50 million, we're looking for a project and we would be happy to build a hotel for you. It didn't take much to convince the Cook Islands government at the time. Franco Picci had persuaded politicians of the Democratic Party government in the late 80s that there was lots of Italian money to be had. It had to be spent on an Italian building contractor, but if they just signed on the dotted line, they would get a loan out of Italy, they would get a, a, an Italian contractor out of Italy, and the next thing you know, we would have a beautiful hotel that we could all be proud of. The loan would be 52 million New Zealand dollars. So our government sort of said, yes, we'll take the money, we'll find you a piece of land. Well, after about eight months, they have no land. So the Prime Minister rang me in Wellington and asked me to come back to Rarotonga and find the land for them. Yaveta, who was the Cook Islands High Commissioner in New Zealand at the time, negotiated the buyout for the remaining 15 years of the lease from the Wigmores. So, with that lease returning to Pa Ariki, the Sheraton now had a place to call home. But the curse and the land dispute were about to show up at the front door. My friend, uh, Mori, I think he knew he would die after he cursed the land. Mike made the traditional garb and staff for his friend Morerua to renew the curse that his grandmother placed at Whaimanga. He feels this is my land and somebody else has stolen it. So on May 25th, 1990, the very day the ground was broken to build the Sheraton, Morerua renewed his grandmother's makutu. I think he was bitter and full of anger. You can feel it without him saying it. And he was talking to the wind. He was pointing in the sky and talking. And he stabbed the ground and talked to the earth. It all went downhill from there. The original plan for the Sheraton um, was to have the hotel and uh, golf course around it with condominiums. Well, it went wrong a couple of times. Uh, on the first uh, occasion, if I recall, was that the contractor was failing in their, in their obligations. The builder, although we didn't know it at the time, was robbing Peter to pay Paul in terms of his building contracts, and it went broke shortly afterwards with very little to show for it other than a mound on Pa Ariki's land. Italian construction company Cicel Spa went bust before the foundations were laid, but not before they filled their pockets. The real problem is why did our managers in Rarotonga allow them to draw something like $20 million before they went bankrupt? So when they left the scene, the whole project was already in trouble. This was embarrassing for everyone concerned. Um, the Cook Islands government, the Italian government. And so out of that, the Italian government said, don't worry, we will lend you some more money. So with an additional loan of 20 million New Zealand dollars, a second Italian construction company, Stephanie Spa, started construction proper. Lots of people will tell you that the Mafia are involved in the building of this hotel, and that is simply not correct. But it's certainly the case that there is a Mafia connection. Mafia money laundering construction projects elsewhere in the world were being guaranteed, underwritten by the same Italian government agency. They froze the entire worldwide portfolio. Uh, which resulted in the officials of the bank or the insurance company that was guaranteeing the loan uh, being locked up. And so then the funds dried up, uh, the contractor wasn't being paid. So they packed up and left pretty quickly. Through no fault of their own, Stephanie Spa found themselves fundless with an unfinished hotel. Yaveta believes he knows where the blame lies. It's corruption on the part of the 
building company seashell, the, the Italian company, and stupidity on the part of the Cook Islands. But they weren't just left with the legacy of a lost hotel. The Cook Islands government also had a crippling debt of $120 million, with nothing to show for it. Perhaps the curse was real. Well, I mean, I think it's easy to say the place is cursed because look at the shambles. But I know why it was a shambles. It's nothing to do with the curse. It's to do with the shambles in the way we dealt with this thing. And the government didn't know what it was doing at the time. For Pa Ariki, the owner and current leaseholder of the land, the evidence is obvious. Well, you know, it, you know, they say it's cursed, but I'm still there. So let's finish that. With the New Zealand government acting as mediators, Yabeta spent years negotiating with the Italian government to reduce the Cook Islands' debt down to just $6 million. So what now for this monument to death, debt and decay? Uh, currently we're running the Raro Buggies um, and also they do uh, paintball uh, and laser tag. At least we're using the, the land for now uh, till we sort out the, the future plans for the property. You know, there, there is a vision about wanting to do something for the land. You know, we want to put things like a um, hotel, a rest home, uh, a golf course, uh, a botanical garden, or uh, you know, a place to walk at the back. That sort of thing, that's what my vision is for that land. And on a small island where tourism is almost at peak capacity, it's no surprise that this land still remains divisive. I couldn't care less about what happens there. I don't like tourism. We are over, we've gone too far. You know what we need is more agricultural land and less building. And with the Sheraton, I think it should be left in as natural as possible for the owners to produce food. Because why do we need tourism? If it's not for our benefit, why do we need it? Because at the moment, it's not for our benefit. It, it's for some company's benefit. Mm -hmm.